so thanks for coming to our session. I'm Joy Collins. Dr. Mark Walcon is here with me. And uh, our topics, we're, we have an ambitious uh, four talks here that we're going to do in a whirlwind fashion as much as we can while we have time. But we wanted to talk about the care of the obese pediatric surgical patient who's undergoing, primarily in this session, non-bariatric procedures. All of our speakers do both general pediatric surgery and weight loss surgery and are experts in caring for these patients. So these principles could certainly apply to bariatric patients as well, but not necessarily. And um, we would like to start out our session, however, um, with a tribute to Dr. the late Dr. Frank DeLuca, uh, done by Dr. Charlotte Kwasnowski. It is our great privilege to provide this tribute to Dr. Frank DeLuca, one of the founding members of APSA. DeLuca is best known for his practice at Hasbro Children's Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island. He also worked ardently on critical care and surgical nutrition at Brown University, which makes him a fitting tribute here in this section on childhood obesity. Dr. DeLuca was born in 1924. He attended medical school at the University of Bologna. Founded in 1088, it is the oldest university still in continuous operation. It is also where four popes received their formal education. From Bologna, Dr. DeLuca moved on to Boston to complete a surgical residency at the New England Medical Center, now a part of Tufts University. He further trained with Dr. Orvar Swenson at the Floating Children's Hospital and stayed on as an attending there for a few years. In 1961, Dr. DeLuca was recruited to Rhode Island Hospital, which had become affiliated with Brown University in 1959. His aim was to help transition from a private practice to a university-based practice. One of Dr. DeLuca's great contributions was to transform critical care at Brown. Under his leadership, Brown had one of the earliest recorded pediatric surgical intensive care units in the late 1970s. Dr. DeLuca was one of the founding members of APSA and also published widely. Most of his over three dozen peer-reviewed manuscripts are clinical research on topics as varied as neck, congenital lobar emphysema, and gastroesophagus. together with Dr. Conrad Wesselhoff, were the only two pediatric surgeons in the state of Rhode Island for more than 30 years. Dr. DeLuca's dedication to the care of sick children was such that his daughter, Beth Ann, told us how, as a child, she sometimes felt jealous because she had to share her father with them. In the 60s, there was no children's hospital in Rhode Island. There wasn't even a medical school, only a two-year graduate program that still required one to finish medical school elsewhere. It was not until the early 70s that Brown Medical School was finally established. During that time, Dr. DeLuca nevertheless continued to maintain an academically rich division, slowly establishing the foundation for the creation of Hasbro Children's Hospital, which opened in 1994, in the establishment of a training program in pediatric surgery. From this two-man division, which for more than three decades allowed most children with surgical problems to be treated close to home, grew an academic program that now comprises six pediatric surgeons, four advanced practice providers, and a pediatric surgery fellow. Dr. DeLuca was fortunate enough to see his dream of an academic pediatric surgery program become reality, and I want to believe that he's looking down proudly on what he created. Thank you. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, and as in the last session, we'll hold questions to the end. I'd like to introduce Dr. Kanika Bowenjalo, who comes to us from the University of Texas, Galveston, where she is the director uh, of the uh, Adolescent Medical Weight Loss and Surgical Weight Loss Program and devotes a significant portion of her research efforts to that. Good afternoon. So I'm going to give you a couple of real-world applications for motivational interviewing and pediatric obesity. So what does motivational interviewing actually do? It's a way for a patient to identify their intrinsic motivation to change. Now, I know that that seems a little touchy-feely to all the surgeons in the room, but keep in mind that there are over 200 clinical trials demonstrating the efficacy of motivational interviewing. It's been applied and studied for over 30 years. There are over 1,200 published studies on MI, and it is now taught in over 43 languages around the world. In addition, the CDC currently recommends its use for the treatment of addictive disorders. So what is motivational interviewing? It is a patient-centered style of counseling. It encourages patients to resolve their resistance to change, 
It originally was developed in the 1980s to treat addictions, and it utilizes five stages of change, and that's pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and the maintenance phase. So in stage one pre-contemplation, when patients arrive, they can't even admit that they have a problem. In stage two contemplation, they're willing to give you that maybe they have a problem. In preparation, they start to ask the question, what can I do about this problem? And keep in mind that when patients come to see you, 80% are only in stage one to three. In stage four, they move into actively working on the problem. <coughs> And in stage five, they're in the maintenance phase. So what don't we want to do with motivational interviewing? We do not want to fix denial. We're not trying to confront irrational behavior. And we're not trying to convince or persuade. So here's a little cartoon on blunt persuasion. Here the doctor is asking the patient, what fits your busy schedule better, exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? We try not to do this in the clinic. <laughs> Here's another good one where uh, the boss has a plaque on the wall that says, you're a failure, you're wasting your life, you'll never amount to anything. And his employee, he tells him it's a motivational technique he learned growing up. And this is one of my favorites. It's a good example of physician preaching. So this is where the physician is telling the patient, stop overeating, stop drinking, stop staying out late, stop fighting, stop worrying, stop eating sweets, stop gambling. And by the time he goes home to his lovely wife, she asks him, what did the doctor say? And he says, I don't know, I stopped listening. We've all been guilty of this. <laughs> so what do we want to do for motivational interviewing? We want to use a tone that's non-judgmental, that's empathetic, and that's encouraging. We want to help families and patients identify the reasons and against changing a behavior and how behavior ultimately affects the way they um, go forward with the goals in their life. If you're ever struggling to remember the core principles of motivational interviewing, keep in mind that motivational interviewing is a collaboration between the physician and the patient. You must have compassion. You must have acceptance of situations that you can't change in the patient's life or that may be completely foreign to you. Through using these skills, you, help to, you hope to evoke and strengthen their intrinsic motivation to change. So this is a great slide that shows where patients start off when they come to see you and where we hope to, that they end up. So remember down at the bottom, 80% of the patients that present are going to be in that phase, that I can't do it, I won't do it, having a lot of negativity. But as you help them recognize their intrinsic motivation to change, they can eventually make it to, yes, I did it. And I want to end in a clip that really demonstrates why it is so important to address childhood obesity. In this clip, you're really going to see the inequity, the socio-demographic inequity that is associated with childhood obesity and the way that the profound effect it has on patients and their families. It was just like every day I went to school, I got picked on. I can't take you. Or what have the kids been saying to you? They'll call me names, just talk. What do the bullies say to her? What do they call her? Kind of fat. Linebacker. You know, just named a little girl. She, little girl don't post to hit nothing like that. A 12 year old girl. It make you worry, then it make you angry about the people that's saying things to her. You know, you're being a parent, you want to protect your child at all times, you know. And with them, you know, just but like she don't have to, she shouldn't have to do that. See, people shouldn't judge people from the outside anyway. So thank you for your time, and I'll take any questions.
I, I think we'll do questions at the end. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, we'll do it. Yeah. I'll bring you back up. Sorry. Let them try. So next is uh, David Lanning. Uh, David is the Surgeon in Chief at Richmond Children's Hospital at VCU and also uh, runs their Adolescent Bariatric Surgery Program. And he's going to talk to us about something that we all see every day in the operating room. Thank you, Mark. Joy? I feel very motivated now. Hopefully everyone else is so quite nice talk. I want to touch a little bit on, uh, as Mark mentioned, the care of the non-bariatric obese patient. Uh, touch a little bit on the, the prevalence um, and talk about some of the key areas, I think, that are important with these patients, such as respiratory situation, uh, venous thromboembolism, pain control. Touch a little bit on some ERAS principles, some final thoughts, and then conclusions. I don't, obviously, everyone knows the numbers, the number of uh, class 3 obesity patients is staggering and continues to rise. Uh, so not only in terms of the patients, but the surgical pathology that goes along with that, such as gallbladder disease, as well as the myriad of other surgical pathology that we see in, in all of our other patients, such as appendectomies, um, the need for liver biopsies, um, phone implication. Certainly there are patients that uh, you can attribute their um, reflux to their obesity, but, but many do have an anatomical problem, such as a hiatal hernia, and in fact do need a phone implication. And then there's some operations that, in fact, um, yeah, might best be done in a minimally invasive manner, um, such as an ingle hernia repair. Respiratory, uh, really from the start, um, you know, just consideration for intubation. These patients um, have uh, often difficult airways, so just the intubation and, and uh, airway management is, is a, uh, can be a challenge. Obviously, postoperatively, all of our patients, to some extent, have some atelectasis issues that need to be addressed, and in, in particular with these patients. And then the, uh, the big concern, really, is obstructive sleep apnea. Obviously, we have a number of these patients that come to you um, for elective care um, that may already have diagnosed with sleep apnea. And of course, you, you all will encourage them to bring their CPAP machine, or at least the, the face mask part, with them to the, operate, or to the uh, hospital um, for use during their stay, but some of these patients really don't know. It's, they suspected sleep apnea or have not been really studied appropriately for this. Um, obviously, as I alluded to earlier, you want to make sure you have appropriate anesthesia support um, uh, as obesity and obstructive sleep apnea are both independent predictors of anesthetic and surgical adverse events. Um, if you have the opportunity uh, to see these patients ahead of time for elective surgery, um, and you suspect um, they may have sleep apnea, in part from maybe the stop, bang um, sort of assessment that, that looks at whether they have loud snoring, their BMI, et cetera, then you have the luxury of having them seen by pulmonary ahead of time, maybe get a sleep study. Uh, again, sometimes that's not always the case, particularly if it's urgent or emergent care that you're providing. Um, certainly keeping the head of the bed elevated uh, after the operation. Um, aggressive pulmonary toilet and early mobilization will all help with um, uh, obstructive uh, issues. Um, even in patients you suspect have sleep apnea, you can um, have your respiratory therapist uh, apply a CPAP machine, some of which will automatically uh, adjust in terms of the settings. Um, one of the things that uh, is in the literature seems to be uh, watching these patients in the PACU afterwards for up to three hours. Um, and and uh, if they have recurrent episodes of desaturations below 90%, um, a low respiratory rate on several, three or more occasions, uh, apnea or a pain sedation mismatch, then those may be patients you really want to consider uh, sending to a, 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 a monitored bed, such as a step down or maybe even the pediatric ICU. And of course, if you, if you strongly suspect they have sleep apnea ahead of time, and if it's a complicated operation, again, I would encourage you to send those patients to the, some monitored bed. <clears throat> in terms of um, post-operative pain control, I think this ties in nicely. Obviously, we all try to minimize the amount of um, narcotics and so forth, particularly in patients you suspect may have some respiratory problems. Um, but obviously, we do want to make sure they have adequate control so they are getting out of bed, um, they're not splinting. 
a variety of uh, efforts have been made, of course, to look at non-opioid um, medications. Uh, I think most people use Tylenol, uh, Ketorolac. We've looked into even using some gabapentin ahead of time, as well as IV infusions of lidocaine, ketamine, and as even mentioned in a talk um, yesterday about dexmedetomidine, um, a lot of ways to provide that pain relief without um, using narcotics. Uh, obviously, um, uh, local anesthetics are very important. Um, I'm very aggressive about using lidocaine ahead of time and then marking at the end, uh, right before the patient wakes up. Um, and if you do need to give narcotics, um, uh, we typically use like a PCA, maybe even with a low basal, try to get rid of the basal early. Um, we think that that ultimately results in less use of higher levels and, and, and more of a steady state um, uh, control. And then, of course, a lot of these operations now, uh, smaller incisions, uh, ideally, you know, uh, can be done in these patients so that there's less discomfort. Uh, Venothromboembolism, obviously, we all are very cognizant of uh, looking for DVTs um, and, of course, what to do if there's suspicion for pulmonary embolism. I would encourage you to in inquire from the f if there's a family history of um, thrombophilia. Uh, we've actually had one of our, our bariatric patients had a portal vein thrombosis, um, which ultimately recovered he, uh, with IV infusion of heparin uh, and then uh, Lovenox uh, out of the hospital. But um, there are, if they do have a strong family history, uh, again, making sure you're very aggressive about uh, preventing uh, these patients from having a DVT and pulmonary embolism. Uh, smoking, some teenagers, um, we've had an 18-year-old um, uh, that actually a, a family smoked, and in fact, he uh, was the patient that had a portal vein thrombosis. He, he didn't tell us that he was uh, smoking. So now we actually screen all of our patients, um, our bariatric patients, for, uh, with cotinine testing, and you certainly may want to do that if you have a uh, family history of smoking and, and uh, some elective operation um, ahead of time. Obviously, sequential compression devices, um, not only, I think most of us are good about that, but making sure that they stay on the patient. Invariably, you go by and round on the patient afterwards and they're on the floor because they've gotten up, gone to the bathroom, and, and no one puts them back on. So being aggressive about educating the nurses and the, and the residents to make sure they go back on the patient when they're not walking. And then probably the key of all this is just really early and frequent mobilization. We basically mandate that our patients every two hours are out of bed walking, and even at night um, while they're sleeping, they get up every four hours. And we have um, um, documentation of this uh, at the bedside. Um, and then, of course, perioperative anticoagulation. I think oftentimes we forget patients that are severely obese, if they're having a gallbladder operation, they, I would still anticoagulate them, similar to our bariatric patients. So I wouldn't forget that um, preoperatively as well as while they're in the hospital. ERAS, I think there is a, certainly a place for ERAS um, in our patients, uh, not only in terms of helping control pain, nausea, making sure you have judicious uh, fluid management of these patients, um, and as well as um, we like to give a preoperative carbohydrate drink, um, probably to some extent help with insulin resistance, but more importantly, probably just to keep them hydrated um, preoperatively. Uh, obviously, we avoid uh, use of catheters, um, and then really trying to start a diet early on. Even our bariatric patients will start um, uh, right after our operation with uh, eating. And then a lot of these can be put into power plans so that they're easily available for your residents and, uh, and other practitioners to, to implement. A couple other thoughts. We've actually talked about this earlier about how nowadays I don't think it's, an, it's really an option to say, well, we're not going to start a bariatric program. Our hospital doesn't want to have bariatric approved toilets and beds. And I think we all have to realize that these patients are going to come in for non-bariatric surgery. And you really have to equip your uh, patient rooms, waiting rooms, and so forth uh, for these patients and their family members. Sensitivity training is something important we've done for all of our um, nurses and so forth on the floors. Um, trauma patients, again, be thoughtful about anticoagulation, caring for these patients, some of which, if they have open <coughs> operations, can have really difficult wounds as well with wound vacs, and I would, I would suggest maybe consideration for early secondary closure of some of these wounds. Uh, I think telemedicine, lots of opportunity um, with these patients uh, that are non-bariatric as well as bariatric, ensuring that they um, are followed up appropriately and, and, and you can identify any post-op issues or problems before they become serious complications and, and, and a cause for readmission. And then ultimately, uh, encourage your colleagues to go ahead and, uh, particularly if someone comes in with appendectomy, I hear this all the time, 
uh, which is an appendectomy on uh, a really obese patient. Well, did you refer them or mention to the family we have a program, multidisciplinary program, to send them to afterwards? Oh, no, I forgot. So encourage your colleagues or refer them uh, to a bariatric program for further care afterwards. So finally, um, obviously there's increased prevalence in severely obese adolescents that ultimately going to require non-bariatric surgical uh, intervention as well. Um, some of these post-op complications can be severe. Um, ERAS principles, I think, have a place for these patients, but may need to be tailored uh, because of their obesity. Uh, and certainly clinical care pathways may mitigate uh, some of the risk in, in this patient population and improve the quality of the care we provide. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks David. That was great. Um, so next we'll have Dr. Jason Frazier come and talk on, he comes from Children's Mercy, Kansas City, and he's going to present on access to the obese abdomen with particular attention to minimally invasive techniques. Hey, good morning. Uh, so this is a little bit of a different spin. This is more of a technical talk. Um, so we have nothing to disclose. The objective uh, of this is to kind of identify how you get into an abdomen, look at the ports, look at the port placement, and possible problems that can uh, happen because of it. Uh, I've got a couple of videos at the end, hopefully they'll work. So obviously this is an issue because we're doing more and more laparoscopy as pediatric surgeons. And like Dr. Lanning was saying, the incidence of childhood obesity continues to skyrocket. Two years ago when I first kind of do it, started doing talks on childhood obesity, that rate was one in six. And over the period of two years, it's gone from one in six to one in five. So now one in five children. And it goes from two years old to 19 years old. So it's not something you're just going to see in your adolescence. You're going to start seeing more and more obese children as this goes along too. This mirrors the adult population. About 40% of adults are obese. About 20% of children are obese. So it's something that we see. And obviously our adult colleagues see more, but we're going to be seeing more and more and more. So it's something we need to be really comfortable with and get increased comfortability uh, as we go forward. So why is this difficult? It's difficult because it's outside of our norm. You know, we're used to, as pediatric surgeons, we're used to operating on little people, uh, little skinny people. But unfortunately, like I said, that's getting, getting different. We're less comfortable, but not only are we less comfortable, but our OR teams can be less comfortable with these, these patients as well. We have thicker abdominal walls, they're heavier, you have to use different equipment, sometimes you have to use sleds, uh, sometimes you have to use um, hover mats, things like that. Things that are all different from our normal everyday routines, of which now have to become our normal everyday routines. Um, and so it's something we need to really be uh, familiar with. So why else is this scary? Well, this is scary because bad things can happen when we start to put ports in people we don't necessarily know how to do. Uh, this is a colon injury, uh, this is a pancreas injury, this is a uh, major vascular injury. All these are from a specific study that showed many, many examples, radiological examples, of port entry problems. And so it's not just something that one person sees. The question is how common, how common are these injuries that you actually see? Well, this is a survey of 17,000 Scandinavian bariatric surgeries. Uh, and they saw, thankfully, only an incidence of, of 0.07%. So it's not very common, but it does happen across all of the other access technique, techniques that are there. The, you don't necessarily just see it with bariatric surgery, you see it with urology, you see it with gynecology, uh, you see it with all sorts of different kind of things. So uh, it's not necessarily just a problem of obesity, but it is harder in obesity. What else can happen? Well, you can get sued. Uh, unfortunately, that's a significant source of malpractice claims that are out there, uh, as the initial entry uh, for laparoscopic procedure is the most common reason for medical malpractice claims too. So now that I got your attention, um, so when we first started preparing for this talk, this is the obligatory, there's no pediatric literature on there. Well, there's no pediatric literature on this. And so we have to kind of gain our, our access, <clears throat> gain our knowledge from our adult experience as well as from our own personal experience. So what are the options? What are the options for gaining access into the peritoneal cavity? There's two kind of dichotomous things. There's the open access techniques and there's the closed access techniques. The closed techniques are the varus needle or the direct trocar entry, either with the sheath port or an optical port, OptiView technique. And then there's the open techniques, kind of the Hassan or the cut down techniques that you can, you can see as well. What's the most common way of doing this? In that same study of 17,000 uh, gastric bypass patients in Scandinavia, they looked at what, how people do get into the abdomen. The shift has gone more towards a varus needle technique followed by an optical trocar technique than an open technique. Well, what does this mean? What's the optical trocar technique? 
So this is where you put your camera lens, usually a zero degree scope, into a, uh, into a port that has a clear base to it. And so you actually look through the port and you gain access that way. So this is before insufflation. You can see uh, these two surgeons are doing a couple different ways. They're holding on to the abdominal wall after incision is made in the umbilicus and you slowly screw in there under direct vision. It works, it works well. They have good outcomes with it. Uh, you, they also, you can use uh, uh, here they're using cokers on the on the fascia on the abdominal wall to kind of lift up uh, to guide in. You can see there the the camera is on with the light here focusing on the abdominal wall. You go through the if you're going right through the umbilicus, right, you might have just a umbilical defect that you can go right through nice and easy. But if you're going off center a little bit, then you have to go through the abdominal wall layers. So this is uh, another option, the direct umbilical access. And this, this is what you can do when the patients are not that obese. I assume this is what a lot of us do uh, as, as pediatric surgeons. Uh, you make a vertical incision uh, through the umbilicus and you dissect down. Hopefully there's a, a, a umbilical a defect that's already there like most patients have. And you enter the peritoneum either bluntly, either uh, with a uh, you know a sheath from like a step trocar or uh, you can use just a, a varus needle or here in this case we use just a hemostat. And then you just put that trocar in gently through the defect that's already there and then you insufflate. And there's several different, like I said, techniques, trocars, uh, things like that, that you can use. There's no, this is not an endorsement of any specific technique or any specific uh, trocars or ports. Uh, the varus technique uh, is through a needle. This is a needle access of the abdominal wall. Here we're getting ready to do a sleeve gastrectomy. And we make a small incision in the left upper quadrant or wherever you're going to uh, look for your initial access. And it's a three pops. The, the third pop is kind of a terminal pop. And once that you get that kind of release feel, you know you're in the belly, you're in the, you're in the peritoneum. And some people use a water drop test, which works just as well. <clears throat> I myself don't like to do that, but that's just personal preference. Uh, you then look at the monitor. There you can see the low pressure, that was five or six, means you're in the peritoneal cavity. This, if it's 15, 18, you know you're not insufflating well. Uh, and then uh, you know you, you have your flow. The various limits about 1.5 liters per minute of flow. Here now we're putting the zero degree scope in the clear clear port here. You can see the, the base there. We're kind of focusing on your fingertips. Now you can see it's in view. Uh, and then we're gonna slowly screw that in uh, through the incision that's made going straight down uh, in through the fascia or in, in through the fat going one, two, three layers. And then you pop through, boop, there's the peritoneum, or there's the omentum. And so we know that we're done and in, into the abdominal cavity there. And the open technique, uh, the umbilical cut down or Hassan technique, this is an infra umbilical incision we're doing for a uh, cholecystectomy. Uh, and you can see we're dissecting down uh, through the subcutaneous tissues uh, here. And this requires a little bit bigger incision uh, to do. Sometimes it's up to about a one and a half to two centimeter incision for a, a, a 10 millimeter uh, or 12 millimeter port. Um, and so here now we found dissected down to the umbilical stock and you can either sequentially use uh, penetrating towel clamps or cokers uh, to kind of pull up on the umbilical stock to get that to the base of the umbilical stock where that meets the fascia. Uh, and there's usually either a direct defect that's there or uh, you create a defect with your cautery there uh, going uh, just onto the fascia. Uh, after you've uh, uh, scored the fascia there then you'll enter the abdominal cavity uh, either with a, a easy blunt instrument there or you can use your finger. Uh, sometimes your pinky will you'll just be able to pop in. Um, you don't necessarily have to do this next step. I, I like to do it uh, just to aid in closing. We put two vicral stay sutures or whatever you're going to use uh, on the fascia just to a, help you have something to hold on to when you're putting that port in there to give an extra modicum of safety or it also helps you when you're closing the fascia there too. Uh, so we put uh, two, two stay sutures in the fascia here. Um, here we're using the uh, uh, groove director uh, just as another uh, area of safety. I call it the resident protector. Uh, helps protect stuff underneath. And then once we get that second stitch in there, we'll tie that down just with one little loop, uh, and then we'll put our port in. And so again, the, the hole's already there in the fascia, the peritoneum's already been accessed, so this is just slides in really super easy. As you can see, it didn't take any force at all right there, then we'll just insufflate and be done. So. What does the literature show? Turned our good friend Cochrane Review and what it says, what it usually says, there is insufficient evidence uh, to support one thing or another. Um, the, what it does show though is that there are less failed attempts uh, with the direct trocar entry, which is the last thing that we showed, uh, versus the varus needle, and that of course comes with more experience. Uh, there's no real differences with regards to complications necessarily between the two, but uh, it does have less uh, trocar injuries. Uh, what about ports? Um, the ports, there's different manufacturers. Um, 
different uh, size ports, different length ports. The most important thing to think about with your ports uh, is that um, there's different lengths. Uh, here at most pediatric hospitals, the short is actually what your standard is, and so you just need to be able to communicate with your uh, scrub team what length you actually want of ports. Um, it doesn't necessarily matter which kind you're going to use, just knowing uh, the size and the length of what you're going to use. Putting the ports in, you have to think about <coughs> where you're going to be putting them because this is the same surgeon, the same hands, the same length, uh, but it's going to be different size, different place based upon the abdominal wall thickness. And think about children too. They're going to have a bigger abdominal wall thickness and more, more size on the outside, but they might not have, they're going to have a smaller size on the inside. So you still need to work on triangulating, but you can't do that as the same space as an adult. Uh, again, so you need to think about your abdominal wall thickness. We're going to put your camera. Uh, you may need to actually angle your ports. You, may, you might not be able to put them straight in to get to your target, especially if you're doing upper abdominal surgery. Uh, and again, they, for, they usually have a short stature on the inside relative to the way they look on the outside. Thank you. Next is uh, Stephanie Walsh, who is the medical director of child advocacy, and she does the pediatrics part of our weight management uh, Strong for Life clinic along with me at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. Hello, thank you. Uh, we're definitely switching gears from the last <laughs> talk for this one. Um, and so when I first told people I was going to Boston to give a talk on weight bias, my friends looked at me and they smiled and they said, have a great time in Boston. Because this whole idea about weight bias and really understanding this topic is not something that's very common. And I think it's a good reminder to us that our patients are dealing with, with the regular public. And while we're in this room and we're really motivated about this issue, the reality is every day they're being faced with issues about weight and stigma. And it, it's really up to us to, to do something about it. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of a challenge because... I know you guys don't like any challenges or competition, but we all know at least one person out there who is really not on board and really doesn't understand what our patients are going through and still think it's okay to make some of those comments. So I'm going to challenge all of us to just take a moment, think about that person, and change ourselves from being the bystanders around this issue to becoming upstanders. So we know that this is what people are thinking out there. People really think that if you shame somebody, it's going to change their behavior, right? Like the person doesn't realize that they're heavy or doesn't realize that things are going on and that they might not be the healthiest. That if we tell them about it and we really make them feel bad about themselves, they're going to want to do something about it. And people also still believe that if you move more and you eat a little less, you can really make a difference. And we know that that's not so true because we know this right? That everything that goes into energy storage and how complicated it is. And, and while this is a great picture and we can use that for ourselves and to make sure that we really know what's going on with the patients, this is not something you're bringing out at, at the party. So you can tell somebody who's making some jokes that are inappropriate that this is the reason those jokes are inappropriate. And this is from the Obesity Society. So this is what our, our families face, right? The media out there, if you Google images of folks struggling with weight, this is what you're going to get. So you get very few pictures of their faces. Everybody is wearing clothes that don't really fit. They're too tight. And then there's a lot of measuring, it seems to be, for, in a lot of these photos that you see, and, and eating very unhealthy foods. If you Google pictures of folks who are thin, this is what you get. And it's really associated. Thinness is associated with willpower and self-control and success. So these are folks, obviously, they're smiling, you're seeing their faces, they're doing things that are active. I think most of us have heard about the Rudd Center, but it's such a fantastic resource for working with this issue, lots of resources for us, for schools, and for any other area as far as working through weight bias. And these are photos that they show of folks who are heavier. So they're doing very normal activities active, in a meeting, buying healthy foods, just, just being in a loving relationship. These are things that our families don't ever see as representatives of themselves. And the same holds true for kids, right? If we show these pictures and kids eating junk food or fast food or, or doing things, the kids are always thin. What if we had pictures like this, where we could actually see kids who weren't quite the average weight actually doing the things that they do and looking happy? it would really change the way that we view folks who are struggling with weight. 
So how do we show prejudice? And I think most of us know this. There's the looks and the stares and um, seating choices. I think there's lots of conversations about how people um, like to eat. It's really shocking to me how many people think that they should comment on what someone else is eating and how they think it's appropriate as if somebody doesn't really know what they're eating in front of them. This, um, the pictures on this are actually, this is fascinating. This woman went all around the UK and she set up a camera and then she took pictures just of herself, just doing normal things like looking at a map and was able to demonstrate all the looks and the stares that she got. And if, if you go and look this up, it is fascinating to see the number of people who are sneering behind her, pointing, laughing. And these are people who saw the camera. The camera wasn't hidden, right? It was out there. So this is still something that's just so acceptable. And I love the video that you showed earlier. Thank you so much for that one. Um, certainly that's some of the most heartbreaking things that we hear in clinic. And I had last week I had a 14-year-old girl who said to me that just this morning, a little boy came up to her and said, I don't know why you don't kill yourself. You're so fat. And that's middle school. But as, as you showed in that video, the harassment and the bullying is just so extensive. Actually, in our program, we have over 50% of our kids who are homeschooled, which is mostly due to the bullying and the issues that they're facing with their, with their school. So we know that weight has a big impact on health care. Kids who are bullied obviously engage in unhealthy methods to try to lose weight, laxatives, vomiting, et cetera. They have lower self-esteem and higher rates of depression. And we know that even in the adult world, folks just don't go to the doctor. I mean, you hear it all the time. I'm going to go as soon as I lose another five pounds. Then I can go because he told me to lose 10. So if I lose five, I can at least go back. And that we, as a profession, are not very good at showing empathy towards folks who are struggling with weight. And the irony of that is that makes folks less likely to do the stuff that we recommend. And so I think it's really important for us to stand up to our colleagues and realize that we are actually having a negative impact on what we say we're trying to do to help people. So the AAP put out this paper last year. This is done by Rebecca Pohl and, and Steve Pont, are, are the lead authors. And this was really a focus on sort of how we need to start addressing this from a pediatric standpoint. So we talked about a few, there's several things that it talks about. I'm going to talk a little bit about role modeling in the clinical environment, but it talks a lot also about language using, you know, patient first language. So children with obesity as to obese children, documenting that this is a disease, focusing on behavior change. Thank you for the MI talk. And then also behavioral health screenings, realizing the mental and emotional implications of being heavy. So when it comes to role modeling, it's kind of like I said at the beginning. If we're going to walk the walk, we better talk the talk and do the whole thing together, right? So what are our own biases? And I think yesterday it was mentioned about the um, Harvard implicit bias test. This is really fascinating. When you, when you do these, though, you have to actually be paying attention because it's, it's timed. So I've had a couple of friends who said, I'm going to do that, and they're trying to do other things as they're taking the tests, and they came back very biased <laughs> in, their, in their analysis. But there's several other scales that you can use. Some of them are shorter and easier. But it's important for us to know where we start. Because again, this is not something that we do overtly, but what are those covert mes messages that we could be sending to patients? And what do we do as a role model? Well, it's important for us to evaluate our own office space, our own staff, and again, our own biases. And we need to advocate. I love that you guys were doing trainings and sensitivity trainings. I don't think that that can be um, overstated and realize that all the patients that come into our programs come into the rest of the hospitals and the rest of the clinics. So what needs to happen in our program is the model, and then it needs to spread everywhere else. Um, it talks about increasing awareness of weight stigma and exactly how damaging it can be, certainly working on anti-bullying policies. And, and there's a lot of schools out there that have the, you know, zero tolerance around bullying. But obviously, as most of us know, that, that just isn't true. So how can we really help families advocate in the schools for their kids? That, that I think, is a, a key piece and a place where we can really play a part. What about the, the clinical environment? And to think a little bit about even something as basic as seating. So Children's just built this beautiful new building, and we have... Um, the, our clinic, the Strong for Life Clinic, moved in. And before we were getting ready to move in, they said, hey, Dr. Walsh, how many bariatric chairs do you need in the waiting room? 
And I said, well, how many chairs are there going to be? And she said, about 100. And I said, well, then I need about 100. And she ha that's really funny. <laughs> no, no, really. Those are more expensive. How much do you need? And I said, well, let me ask you something. How do you see this playing out? So the patient comes up, registers. We say, thanks so much for coming to the Strong for Life Clinic. Now, you guys can go sit in those seven chairs that are sitting over there. And thankfully, she laughed herself <laughs> before I could say, that's not happening. <laughs> but it's still that idea, right, that, that it doesn't have to be everywhere or that the patients that are coming to this clinic are different than the patients coming to any other clinic. So if you see families in your waiting room and the parents are standing, they're standing because they don't feel comfortable to sit in the chairs that you have out there. And you don't necessarily realize that, and no one is ever going to say that to you. But that's a key component of that as well. And I'll tell you, when we started, we, we bought chairs with arms because we thought people could use it to push up. And we had a mom who literally got stuck in the chair. It was a bariatric chair with arms. And that's just, that's just unacceptable. There's always been a lot of talk about where you weigh your patients, obviously doing that in private. And I don't know if you guys have taken any kids to pediatric offices, but my pediatrician still weighs everybody out. Not necessarily in public, it's in, it's in an area, but other people could walk by and see that. So getting a room, having an area where we can measure our patients and making sure the scale goes above 250 is really important. We had to actually start using the wheelchair um, in our old space, we had to use the wheelchair scale in order to measure some of, weigh some of our patients. And because we insisted on doing it privately, that meant that we held up the whole registration process because no one could be around. And then we quickly got a scale that went as high as we needed it to go. And I don't know how many of you guys know about the fact that wall toilets only hold 250 pounds. And so if you are going to have a, a program and, and and have families that are coming in that are really struggling, you can buy a very cheap jack that goes underneath the toilet and can actually raise it up to about 800 pounds. And these things are, are very simple, but they can make a huge impact. So as we're looking at this issue, and we are the advocates, we are the ones who are ready to stand up for our patients out there. So as we become the upstanders, we also need to help remind people that in the end, the most important thing you can be is kind. Um, so I think we have a couple of minutes for questions if the panelists wouldn't mind coming up to the stage for a few minutes. Sorry to make you come back. My seat. So, yeah. Hey, Fasil Qureshi, Dallas. Thank you, everybody. Um, just since I'm in the practice as well, how do you approach the family who's coming for an appendectomy in a 14-year-old who weighs 300 pounds? And in that acute phase, I find talking to them about weight loss surgery or referring them to another clinic doesn't actually go down very well. And I'm always struggling how to broach that topic with them. Great question. Um, actually, Try to reserve that more for the in the follow up. You know, when I see him back in clinic, follow up, make sure things are going well, um, and uh, so, so that seems to be a better time to transition. Then, oh, by the way, I'm glad they're healing up fine from their appendectomy, but I will also make sure I get their contact information so that if they don't show up for follow up, uh, we'll reach out back out to them and check on them, and then make sure they get at least that information and, and encouragement to to follow up with our program. Thank you. And then follow up to that. It's, I find that the parents or the caregivers are actually the tar original targets of the conversation, trying to figure out if they're in the contemplative phase or wherever they are in their phase of action. Um, and the, the patient may be ready, and the patient's family or caregivers are not. And then we're fighting two battles. And how do you approach that? So um, I'm going to go back to like what we were talking about when the patient comes and they're doing the app and everything. I, I found that the majority of the patients that come to my clinic have not been told that they're obese. And a criteria to get into the clinic is that you have to be obese. And so the first thing I do is I say, has anybody ever shown you your child's growth chart before? 
and typically nobody has shown them their child's growth chart before. And so, and because most of, the, from, from our perspective, our patients are very disadvantaged on a low socioeconomic standpoint. And so by showing them that graph, they can really visualize where their child is. They know they're not getting picked on and that sort of thing. So when they come back, they actually are very responsive to that. So, cause it's coming from more of a primary care standpoint than, you know, the operation was more difficult because you're obese kind of thing. Um, in terms of how we, the disconnect between patients and families, the first thing we say when the families come in is that families that stick together are the families that are successful. And so we hit that very strong from the beginning. Um, and you'll see that it, it's always going to be that way, where it's always coming together like this. But we just keep on with the motivational interviewing aspect of it. And the parents, so like you said, sometimes the kids are there and the parents are not, and they just don't understand uh, the relevance for the other children in the house. Um, and But the more they come to see you, usually around visit three or four, they start to get it a little more. Thank you. One of the most powerful things you can do is ask for permission. So you can say, hey, is it okay if we talk a little bit about his health and how this might be impacting overall for your child? And that usually then says, yeah, I heard you. And then if they say, well, I'm not really worried about it, you can say, oh, I hear you're not really worried about it. Well, when you're ready, I'm here to talk about it. Are there, uh, oh, sorry. One, one other follow-up to that. Another um, option is to, to, to find out who the primary care provider is. And uh, so sometimes we'll, if we feel like they're not responsive to the discussion, reach out and say, by the way, we noticed uh, this patient came in, is very heavy, has some comorbidities. Um, we're very concerned about this. And sometimes the families will respond more to the, the primary care provider and, and continued encouragement uh, uh, from them to, to be sent to us. Hello, Rob Sivers, uh, West Palm Beach. Um, that motivational interviewing thing is a long, long time in coming. Thank you very much for that. We started a Prochaska cognitive behavioral therapy model 20 years ago based on exactly that. The problem is that by definition, uh, you cannot use harm reduction in a Prochaska type cognitive behavioral therapy model. Have you, and you used the word addiction a couple of times, have you come to terms with developing an addiction management program as opposed to a harm reduction model? And um, what is the substance that you target? Because by definition, you can't stop eating food. That's a, that's a uh, great comment. And so, no, we haven't done that yet. We haven't made that switch from the model yet. Um, but we do treat it more like an addiction. Um, and and you know, obesity has only been recognized as a disease, you know, by the CDC in the past few years. And so when they come in, we say they're treating a disease. And I think that does a little switch in, in, in the mind, and as well as to the pediatricians, because they're not necessarily viewing it as a disease. And so if you're going to say that obesity is a disease, then you have to treat it. And you can treat that with lifestyle, with medications, and with surgery. And to piggyback on, on, on that, too, is when I see some patients that are having kind of trouble wrapping their head around obesity as a disease, uh, I sometimes will go as far and say, you know, if you had a cancer and you had a tumor, would you want an operation to cure that cancer? And 100% say yes, of course. Well, you have a medical obesity. problem that is just as deadly in your long term as cancer is. So now we have things we can do about it, whether it's through medical weight loss therapy or surgery, so let's do something about it together. And so sometimes you need to take that drastic of an approach, which is a little bit more of an aggressive thing, but sometimes that works, too. Avicii Tony Milano in Italy. I have a technical question for you. What kind of procedure do you propose as bariatric surgery? And do you have experience in endoscopic procedure? Thank you. I think we all can answer that. But. <laughs> David can talk about yeah. endoscopic procedures, I guess. Well, it's a variation on your, uh, yeah. on your application. I think um, majority of the surgeons operating on adolescent patients now are using the gastric laparoscopic vertical sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, we did a pilot study of um, uh, gastric plication, laparoscopic gastric plication, and, and uh, on a handful of patients and had good results. Um, you know, the thought that is, you know, since we're only really reaching less than 0.1% of the patients that ultimately really have indications for, for weight loss surgery, uh, yeah, would there be other surgical options that, that maybe we entice providers, uh, pediatricians, and family members to, to send their patients to us? So um, maybe so. 
And Ayad Al Katani has a series now of uh, endoscopic gastric plications. Mm -hmm. I think he's, yeah, yeah, something like a thousand of them. And they're all not under four years of age either. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, and it looks like it's, it's successful, but not as successful as uh, mm -hmm. surgery, and nobody knows how long it'll last. And there are other devices also on the market, uh, you know, the balloon and then the sleeve, not to be confused with the gastric sleeve, but the, the sleeve that deploys in the small intestines to induce malabsorption is also out there, but none of those are uh, approved for in, in children. Thank you guys for some great presentations. Um, uh, there's a couple, a couple th questions that I had. Uh, one was a, a technical question. Uh, when you're dealing with a, the obese patient, I think this is something that uh, I think a lot of people may have, may struggle with. Uh, I know my partners do, and, and I do as well. Is when you have the the obese patient who comes in complaining of inguinal pain, and there's no obvious hernia, how do you proceed with that kind of patient? And then the second question was, who do you require to be at your visits with the patient when they are being worked up for? bariatric surgery because oftentimes you have the family member who's really engaged and the child and then there's the one who's really resistant who needs to hear the information who's not there so what do you what is y'all's practice in, in dealing with these so, Stephanie, so do you want to answer the first? You want to answer the second okay, question first, the or do you want to take the, te the technical <laughs> question? I'll leave that one. <laughs> So that it's, yeah, we do the same thing as far as tr getting everybody on board and all the family members in, and we talk about what is where, where it's going on. Is there anyone who we feel could possibly sabotage this, and then work with that family? But sometimes it's really hard to get that other person in. I do a lot of phone calls then in that state, but it, if there is that person, it certainly is a red flag, and we really try to work to resolve that prior to them having surgery because it, it can be a definite um, negative impact. Who wants to take inguinodynia in the obese patient? It's not. It's not. It's not an easy. It's not easy. We're all standing here because it's not easy. Um, you know what? What? What I've done is, you know, you can. It, if it really is a. If it was, I haven't had one yet that was just such a classic history that I said I'm going to put a scope in and just see. Um, and the other option I think is is ultrasound is helpful. Uh, you know, Marcus showed us earlier today how you can really see the uh, inguinal sac uh, if, you're, if you know what you're looking for. But ultrasound, if you have a good ultrasonographer, is a reasonable way to go. Maybe uh, with them standing up and yeah. bearing down. I don't know. Do you guys have any magical tricks for that? No, I don't have no. any. I, I do think that if you're going to fix an inguinal hernia in an obese patient, that a laparoscopic approach is so much easier yeah. than open, so much easier. I have stuck a scope in a hand, a small, like a couple of times, and been unsat, like not found actual yeah. clinical hernia. So I, yeah. I think that's a great way to go, unless you're pretty convinced. Uh, Aaron Lisher, uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Um, appreciate the uh, shedding some light on all of this, um, and that we've devoted an hour to it. I encourage APSA in the future to embrace this as as part of the program and to talk more about bariatric surgery i noticed that we didn't talk about it very much but i think that pediatric surgeons have a great role to play in this you know there, there are a lot of training programs out there and um and, and and not a lot of the trainees are doing a lot of bariatric surgery when i finished fellowship and came back then i sort of partnered with the adult folks, which who I knew and and uh, was able to go through the credentialing process that way. But I think that, you know, as Jason showed that the, you know, the incidence of this is ever growing and that this society, um, you know, should be a leader in this. And we don't need to have, you know, these are not little adults. These are big children and they uh, they deserve our attention. That's a great way to wrap this up. <laughs> and stay tuned for next year. <laughs>